director, and he's going to carry through this compelling program. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate that. And Jerry's going to remain in the background so that she can be our support uh, with handling questions uh, and answers that uh, would, might come up on our Facebook Live page. Um, so uh, thank you once again, everyone, for attending today's presentation. We've got a nice crowd forming, and we've already started broadcasting to Facebook Live. Um, we are recording today's presentation, so um, we'll upload that video recording to White Memorial's page uh, so that you can, uh, White Memorial's YouTube page at some point in the future, so that you can see this presentation for yourself at a later date or you can pass it along. Um, uh, this is a great topic at this time of year because um, the leaves are starting to fall and um, have been falling in, and it's a time of year where you then start to look at uh, the, those types of projects in your yard where, and you start to uh, look at the trees in a little different way. And one of the uh, big things that we see here in the Litchfield vicinity is that a lot of our ash trees are starting to show the signs of uh, decline um, of uh, caused by the emerald ash borer, a new invasive species um, that uh, is, is devastating our local ash trees. And unfortunately is having a massive impact on our um, forest ecosystems and as well as the trees that are growing in our yards. Um, and I, I don't wanna steal any thunder here. So, um, because I think that our speakers are really gonna present all the, all the various topics very well. Um, so we've got a great panel today. Um, we have uh, Claire Rutledge from the, from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, Claire does a, a lot of research. She's an entomologist by training and she's done a lot of research in Connecticut on the emerald ash borer. Um, the insect is a wood boring beetle because that's her, one of her special specialists or specialties as a taxonomist, but as an ecologist as well. Um, and she does some amazing work with uh, a variety of other organisms that are um, uh, native to the United States that are uh, helping us with the surveillance program, but also uh, some species that are helping us with uh, controlling, the, the, controlling this insect as well. Uh, we have Bud Neal uh, from Woodbury, Connecticut, who is uh, a licensed arborist in the state of Connecticut, and his company is Neal Tree Service. He's been on the front lines of this question with, uh, with emerald ash borer since it started arriving in uh, southern New York, and he's uh, been a, a, at the forefront of understanding how this plant or how this insect is impacting ash trees throughout Connecticut. Um, in from various uh, in people's yards to uh, a variety of other uh, spaces, and he'll share his experiences as well. And then, um, last but certainly not least, is Chris Donnelly, who is uh, an urban forester, just recently retired from Connecticut uh, Department of in, uh, Energy and Environmental Protection, um, and is now living in the Northford, Connecticut area, full time. Um, and all three of our um, all three of our, our speakers are um, uh, board members of the Connecticut uh, Tree Protection Association. Um, and so they, they are all uh, really wonderful speakers. And so we're really glad to have them today. Um, uh, so without further ado, I guess I'll turn it off, turn it over to Chris first, I guess. And then, then uh, Claire will follow. And then uh, Bud will then uh, be the last speaker for the day. We'll save all of our questions and, and answers at the end, towards the end of the presentation. Um, and we'll sort of have a panel discussion oriented question answer period. Um, and uh, for those of us that are on Zoom, you can address your questions in the uh, Q&A section of your Zoom, uh, Zoom window or maybe in the chat box. And I'll facilitate those portions while Jerry will uh, help us with the Facebook Live, those folks that are asking questions on Facebook Live. So without further ado, uh, Chris, take it away. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Um, you have to enable my screen sharing. Oh, sorry, did that on the last call. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Very good, there you go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, glad I got through these uh, screen sharing tests. It's always the, the most interesting part of the presentation. 
Um, uh, I'm, I'm glad to have this opportunity, uh, although I'm sorry it's all under these circumstances. Um, we've been dealing with the Emerald Ash Borer in Connecticut since uh, the year 2012. Um, and we've had the unfortunate experience to watch it march its way through the state. Uh, so it does give us a lot of background with regards to how uh, the Emerald Ash Borer behaves and what it does to ash trees. My role in this is to give you a quick introduction to um, the, the trees themselves, um, the host plants for the Emerald Ash Borer. Um, so it would be nice to say that um, the only um, trees that the Emerald Ash Borer attacks are ash trees. Technically, that's not true. It can feed on white fringe tree, um, but that's not its preference. White fringe tree is, to my understanding, not native to Connecticut, but it's not an uncommon ornamental. Um, so you might uh, have uh, a white fringe tree on your property. Um, and so you should know that it has the potential to attack, but it's often not fatal to the white fringe tree. Um, it also does not attack either mountain ash or prickly ash, because even though they're called ash, they're not, they're technically, they're not ash trees. And so uh, emerald ash borer does not bother with them at all. You know, I, I guess we all have our favorites of one particular kind of tree or another. This is one of my favorite ash trees. It's a white ash down on the green in Brantford. Um, spectacular condition. Um, I'll go back to it a little bit later. But um, let's use it to introduce ourselves to the ash tree. Uh, one of the characteristics of uh, the ash trees in general is this interesting ridgy bark, kind of with a, a diamond pattern. That's how it's often described in the book, and you can kind of see what they're, they're talking about. Um, but as far as identifying the ash tree, it is um, pretty much the only native uh, tree that has both compound leaves and that are oppositely attached. So let me explain that. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'm trying to circle one whole leaf of the ash tree. It's got a series of leaflets that come off it. Um, looks a bit like a feather in structure, but that's considered a whole leaf. And because it has sub leaflets, it's considered to be compound. And when you look closely at where these leaves uh, actually attach to the twig, uh, you can see the attachments are opposite each other. So that's what I mean when I say it's a compound leaf uh, oppositely attached um, tree. Um, and, and, and that basically is the only one that's native to Connecticut that does that. And here you see a much closer look at the attachment as well as the end bud of uh, ash trees, which of course, looking at ash, you, you, you you learn these characteristics pretty quickly. And this is, um, this is a pretty good indicator that, that you have an ash tree, either the leaves or the buds. Um, and these are the fruits. Um, they're single-bladed Samaras. Um, maples are double-bladed Samaras, just to, <laughs> why I'm making that reference. Uh, basically, it's, it's just one um, helicopter blade um, with the, uh, the seed itself at the, the bottom of the, uh, of the Samara or the blade. Um, as far as kinds of ash in Connecticut, there are three species. Um, white ash, the Fraxinus americana. This is, a, I didn't get my updated version. I've misspelled it. Uh, it's americana, uh, by far the most common woodland ash. Also the largest of the three ash trees in Connecticut. Um, the, um, it, it, so, so when we talk about ash trees, mostly in Connecticut, we're talking about white ash. Green ash um, is also, somewhat um, present in Connecticut. Um, it's, it's more of a riverside tree. Um, it, it's a little bit smaller generally than, than white ash, um, but it is the ash tree that's often planted in urban settings. So for instance, if you see ash tree planted in a parking lot or along a street, chances are it's gonna be green ash. And then finally, there's black ash, um, which is mostly a swamp tree, uh, often find, found along with green ash. It is the smallest of our three native species. But we do have, you have a good chance of seeing all three in Connecticut. Uh, there, there's, there, you know, if you look up in any good tree uh, ID guide, you, you, you'll quickly learn how to identify the three ash trees, uh, both from other trees and then from each other. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but they do have distinctly different appearances, for instance, when we look at the buds. As far as the, um, the presence of ash in our forest, um, here's a list of the top 10 trees in Connecticut, and you won't see um, uh, ash listed on it. But if we eliminate the uh, softwoods, um, that allows us to bring white ash and black oak onto our list. 3% um, might not sound like a lot in terms of the number of trees in the forest, 
Um, but you see, by the time you get down to number six on the list, um, we're talking about 3% of the forest with uh, black cherry. Um, there, we are blessed in Connecticut in having a, a wide uh, range of species um, of kinds of trees in our forest. And so um, white ash is a, is a significant component of our forest. And even though it's only what one in every uh, 30, 35 trees, um, it's still quite a few uh, when you get out there and start looking. Um, as far as uh, in our urban setting, um, the the three percent number kind of continues to hold. Um, it's 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 present, and you'll 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 see it out there. But it's um, um, you know it's it's not in the same numbers as, for instance, maples, which uh, tend to dominate our our urban streets. Um, and of course, ash isn't distributed evenly uh, across the state. Um, this map, uh, the gray areas are the non-forested areas, some cities and towns built up areas. Um, but the colors range from uh, low concentration yellow to high concentration blue. And so when you see the, the blue and purplish areas, those are the areas of highest concentration of ash trees. And yep, um, that means Litchfield County has uh, one of the higher concentrations of ash in Connecticut. Um, it, yep, let me move on. Um, so why are ash trees important? Uh, commercially, they're, they're actually uh, quite well known and quite important. Um, we know them, for, for instance, from uh, baseball bats. Louisville Sluggers are uh, typically uh, have been uh, manufactured from ash uh, logs. Um, and also shovel handles and a lot of other similar tools. The, one of the great features of, of ash wood is it's both strong and flexible. Um, so if you're uh, digging a, a hole here in Connecticut somewhere and you need to work the rocks out, um, you know how important it is to have a, a shovel handle that's a little bit springy and still strong um, in order to get the job done. Um, ash also um, produces beautiful lumber um, that is uh, appreciated um, by furniture manufacturers. And so uh, um, ash has, has commercial importance that way. Um, and, and in many other ways, um, electric uh, guitar bodies uh, are often made from ash wood. Um, it has a, a, an important commercial use. Um, another use for ash and, and one that's um, cultural as well as uh, commercial um, is the use of ash for basket re uh, making. Um, and, and in particular, black ash uh, has been used traditionally uh, for making baskets um, going back uh, to Native American day. Um, and, and you can see the gentleman off to the um, left side of the screen. And what he's actually doing is beating an ash log, which the way the wood is constructed within the tree, um, it crushes uh, part of the structure. And it, the wood lifts off in these strips, which then could be cut and, and make perfect splints for weaving baskets. So there's a commercial aspect, obviously, to ash trees that were uh, hate to lose. There's, there's also, um, you know, equally, if not more important, the ecological uh, role that ash play. Um, for instance, um, uh, pileated woodpeckers uh, commonly seek out ash trees in which to uh, uh, hollow out to, to make their nests. Um, there are, uh, according to Doug Tallamy, um, something like 150 native species of insects that use ash uh, for part of their life cycle including 27 that, that use uh, ash pretty much exclusively. Um, and so here's uh, the ash sphinx moths, which obviously um, in the caterpillar stage is feeding on uh, ash leaves. Um, and, and one thing I came across, I was surprised to, to learn this, um, is that um, actually tadpoles tend to um, make great use of ash leaves. Uh, the leaves themselves are low in tannin, so when they fall in the, um, you know, the vernal pools and streams and such, um, they're primary food source for the developing uh, frogs. Um, interesting. But of course, the, um, the big thing, uh, what, what makes us all, all so concerned is that, you know, we, 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 knowing our forest history, we know how much um, damage has occurred over the years. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've lost, for instance, pretty much as a functional component of the ecosystem, American chestnut. Um, exotic um, 
disease has come in and, and affected the, uh, of it, uh, the presence of American elm. Eastern hemlock uh, came under attack starting in the mid 1980s from, um, a, 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 again, an exotic insect. And so that's in diminished numbers. Um, there's concern particularly uh, with regards to climate change, um, how sugar maples will do in the future and Eastern white pine. Um, the last few years have been bad years for, bad years for the oaks uh, because of the gypsy moth uh, outbreak. Um, so it's, it's very important that we pay attention to what's going on in our forests. And, and, and we do hate to see any species uh, being hit as hard as apparently the ashes are to be now. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Claire. Okay. Hi, everybody. Just trying to figure out how to juggle my screen and Zoom. But okay. All righty. Here we go. Okay. So my job is to talk about the evil insect that's impacting ash across the state. Um, this evil insect is the emerald ash borer and here's a glamour shot of it. It's actually a really quite beautiful beetle. Um, and I'm just going to first talk a little bit about the biology of this beetle and then I'll talk about um, how it got here and where it's been and where it's going and um, then we'll, we'll talk about the damage, et cetera. Okay, so let's start with the biology. Um, this is uh, an insect with a complete metamorphic life cycle. So of course it starts over here with the adults and those are the beetles, the adult beetles, but the eggs, um, when they hatch, they become larvae which bore into the wood. And because it has a complete metamorphosis, they look nothing like each other. Um, so the larvae look like little flat worms, they're called flat-headed borers. Um, they then pupate and after they finish pupating emerge as adults and around we go. So in a little bit more detail on the biology. So the adults emerge out of the tree where they were living as larvae in June, uh, more or less. Um, the adults feed for about 10 days before mating and that's actually very important for our management of emerald ash borer. That small detail means that there's more ways we can get at their life cycle than we would if we couldn't do that. Um, and the adults live about five weeks. So um, a female can lay a lot of eggs, um, usually about 50. And the eggs are laid in the crevices of the ash bark. And so they're really, really, really hard to find because they're tiny. And they hatch um, and the larvae go right into the wood and they feed on the tunnel, the cambium and the phloem of the, of the tree. Um, and they feed throughout the summer. Um, all the different stages of the larvae uh, eat the cambium and the phloem. And this is what kills the tree. Um, they, they girdle it. So the phloem is the tissue right under the bark that transports um, sap from the leaves to the roots. So it, it, it takes the sugars that are produced by photosynthesis and brings them to the root of the tree. So when you girdle the tree, you're starving it. Um, and depending on how many beetles there are around, it's definitely a numbers game, but they can kill a tree in, in two to six years. And this is a picture of a tree trunk um, of an ash and the bark has fallen off because they're feeding under the bark. And you can see just this ridiculous number of tunnels. So once the larvae finish feeding, they go a little ways into the wood or they go a little ways into a really nice thick bark on a mature tree 
and they create a little little chamber for themselves. Oops. There we go, a little chamber for themselves in the wood. And we call this a J-shaped larva. And then in the spring, they start to pupate and then eventually again emerge as an adult. So, again. so where did this, this beetle come from? Um, it is from Northeastern Asia. And this is um, the range here. And it actually does go into Russia and into Mongolia, uh, but, but this is roughly, roughly its range. So it's far Eastern Asia. And it was first found in Detroit, Michigan in 2002, uh, where it probably arrived in wooden packaging in the early 90s. Uh, but it wasn't really, it wasn't discovered until 2002. Um, this is a map from 2004 showing what the situation was then. So it was originally, as I say, discovered um, in Michigan, but then also in Ontario, which is right here. Um, and the first year it was found, you know, keep in mind it had already been here since the 90s, so it had already spread quite widely. So when it was first found, um, it was encountered, you know, sort of ringing Detroit. And then the next year we found it further out. And then the year after that, even further out. But this really isn't a record of the beetle's spread. It's a record of our finding of the beetle. And one of the constants in the story of the Emerald Ash Borer has been that it's ahead of us. It's always getting there before, before we know. Um, it's it's um, very cryptic and it, it's good at spreading. And there's a lot of ways that it's spread throughout the country. And of course, we don't know how it got to any particular spot usually, but, but these are the different ways it can spread. Um, on its own, it's a good flyer and, and they tend to disperse from the tree they were born on and fly away. And usually they're just gonna go as far as the next available good host tree, most of them. But some of them will keep going um, and go a kilometer away. So they can, they can spread um, each year on their own and infestation will spread usually about a kilometer, a kilometer and a half. But that's not the only way they've spread because they wouldn't have made it from Michigan to Connecticut in 10 years if they were only going one kilometer a year. Um, it's been spread throughout the country um, much more rapidly by hitchhiking. Um, so, you know, this is kind of a silly picture of a cicada on a car, but there are uh, documented reports of them hopping on a car and going down the highway 90 miles away and then hopping back off. Um, nursery stock, you know, saplings that were grown in the areas that were infested by um, emerald ash borer before we knew it, and then shipped to other parts of the country uh, probably had a fair amount of, of impact on spread uh, before we knew it was here. After that, this nursery stock movement was tightly regulated in, in quarantine, but before then. And then probably the most common way it's been spread is in firewood. Ash makes great firewood. And if you have a bunch of dead ash trees in your yard, it, it feels like it makes a lot of sense cut down that tree, split it up into firewood and take it off to your, um, when you go camping, take it off to the park, take it off to your hunting cabin. Um, and that people did that a lot. And a lot of the saddle, you know, the infestations that people saw in the first couple of years were up at people's summer houses or, or hunting cabins or whatever. Um, and they're, they're hiding right under the bark. So you don't see that that the tree is infested necessarily, or if you don't know what's going on, you don't understand it. Um, and so one of the messages I'm always trying to get across when I talk to people about this beetle and other beetles, wood boring beetles, is you don't know what's in your wood. You know, even if you know not to move ash wood, you don't know what else is hiding in any kind of wood. So even though it seems crazy to buy firewood at 
a campground or or up near your cabin instead of just bringing all the free firewood you have in your backyard the cost of that is not free you're potentially spreading destructive organisms okay lecture over well that lecture let's move on um so this is actually this is from from last year so the map is a little bit further now but remember when i showed you that first map a couple slides ago the beetles were just right up here in michigan and beginning to spill over into Ohio and Indiana. And that was in 2004. Now in 2020, um, it is pretty much everywhere east of the Mississippi River and the first tier states west of the Mississippi River. And it's even up here in Colorado. That was definitely a jump. Um, and it's up in Manitoba and um, Ontario and Quebec and Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia. So it is getting around. And as Chris said, or Jamie said, I'm not sure who said, it got here to Connecticut in 2012. Um, so this is, this is a little map uh, I call the March of the EAB. And it's just looking at where it was and where we first found it in Connecticut and how it's moved through the state over the years. Um, so when we first discovered it, it was actually in the town of Prospect, Connecticut. Um, and that find was um, rapidly uh, followed by finds in uh, Naugatuck, Beacon Falls, Bethany, and Waterbury. Um, so these towns right in here. So. As we moved on, 2013, 14, 15, and 14, since we're talking at White Memorial, uh, 14 is the year it was it detected in, in Litchfield, um, the town of Litchfield itself. Um, then 15, 16, 17, 18. Um, and even though, oh yeah, there we go, 19 and 20. So. It's pretty much coast to coast in this, or edge to edge in the state. Um, there are a few little blank spots, but those really reflect more um, a lack of monitoring or reporting than than an actual lack of the beetle. Um, however, when a beetle the beetle first arrives in an area, or when we first able to detect it, it's probably on, only a year or so after the beetle has gotten there. And the real impacts of the beetles don't tend to show up for another four or five years. So let me show you, uh, this is just a, a scale that we use to um, talk about how dead an ash tree is. So when we're doing assessments, but you can see the process. And one of the most obvious things you see with an ash tree dying is, is the reduction in canopy. So um, on the far left, you have a nice healthy ash tree. You can see the canopy is kind of opaque. Um, you're not seeing the sky all the way through it. Um, two, you've got a much thinner canopy. Um, stressed trees often have like little smaller leaves. And then three, you start to have branch dieback and whole sections of the canopy. Certain branches are dead. Four, you can see there's not much left to that tree. And then five, you finally have a dead tree. And um, this is just going to be a gallery of some of the symptoms and um, signs of damage that you can see from emerald ash borer. And these, unfortunately, are all pictures from Connecticut. Uh, this one was taken by Chris Donnelly, who just spoke. Um, in Bristol, Connecticut, this is a lovely allay of green ash. And you can see that they're not looking very good. Um, and you can see two classic symptoms of emerald ash borer attack in these trees. Um, the branches are, are beginning to be very sparse with their leaves. And then the other classic symptom you can see is if you look down the trunks, the trunks look um, on some of them, like here, look very bushy. And what you're seeing there is what's called epicormic branching or water sprouts or witch's brooms. But this is the tree's attempt. It's been cut off from the leaves up in the canopy have been cut off 
uh, by the borer's tunnels that are cutting off the, the phloem and the cambium. And so the tree is putting out emergency leaves below the point of the damage in an attempt to continue to photosynthesize and create food for itself. Um, and green ash in particular seems to just create these huge bushy bottoms. Okay. So, okay, let's just, um, that's a picture of, of what happens to the trees. Um, and we're gonna go back to some more damage and symptoms, but this is just a picture of, of what's been called the death curve. Um, and this is specifically from Fort Wayne, Indiana, but this is a pretty good approximation of what, what happens anywhere you have emerald ash borer. Um, so the problem you have is emerald ash borer is um, not native and the trees are very bad at defending themselves against it. So when they first come into an area, and this is an invasive species, they'll usually come in a very low population and impact only a very small portion of the trees. So um, the first year, in this case, it was 2007, what they got there, very small number of trees were impacted. Um, you have very low levels of dead trees. And, but the curve, as it goes up, it's not the same number of trees that are impacted each year. It's an exponential curve because nothing is stopping the beetle from growing. They have this large food resource of healthy trees of the phloem that nothing native can eat because the tree defends itself from other native borers that would otherwise want to eat that food. So they have an unlimited food source and um, they don't have any natural enemies uh, that are eating them. So you end up with this exponential growth. So usually or often what happens in towns or areas that are infested, it starts out very small. It's very difficult to see. You see some dry back, you know, maybe that's something else. And then it goes from maybe it's here to, oh my gosh, all the trees are dead over the period of about five years. Because of the exponential nature of this curve, you know, the time to act is when you find out you have the beetles in the area before you get to this place where all of, you know, where, where it explodes on you. Um, and I think with Litchfield, we first detected it in Litchfield in 2014. So you guys are six years out. So you're sort of in the exploding part of things. So, um, you know, Bud's gonna be talking about control and treatment options for your trees. And so this is definitely, the time that you need to grab that information and run with it because um, we're six years into the infestation at least here in Litchfield. Okay, so back to uh, pictures of damaged trees. These are some trees from the first summer when we were detecting emerald ash borer for the first time, but you can see it already been here for a while because we already have some dead trees. So this is a, a really huge tree. This is the first infested tree that we actually found. And um, this is a, a normal size human being here, a grown up adult person. Um, this is a 42 inch caliper tree. So it was a, a very large tree and you can see it's completely dead. Um, here you can see some branch dieback. Um, Bud's in here somewhere. I don't know if he's up in the top or down on the ground, uh, but here's some other trees in prospect. Okay, another symptom of the the attack by an emerald ash borer is is woodpecker damage. Now I said they don't have any natural enemies, and that's actually not strictly true because their biggest natural enemy here in the states is woodpecker damage. Is woodpeckers? Woodpeckers eat bugs in trees. They're going after that larvae, and you usually don't see the damage until the tree is really heavily infested, and the woodpeckers are are focusing on that tree because it's a great source of food. And when they forage, woodpeckers do a behavior we call gleaning, where they flip off some of this thick, quirky, diamond-shaped bark that, that Chris was talking about so that it's easier for them to get at the larvae. And when they do that, they expose uh, new bark tissue to the air so it, 
it, it's light colored. And so when you look at the tree, you see these light blonde streaks on the tree trunk. Um, my very favorite description of them ever was from a, a citizen who called about his tree and he said, it looks like a crazy squirrel highway, but um, we call this blonding, less imaginative than squirrel highway, but that's what we call it, it's blonding. So when you see a tree in your area that has blonding like this, this tells you that it's highly infested. Um, now, of course, it could be infested with something besides emerald ash borer, but with ash trees and in the current conditions, if you see blonding, it's a pretty good sign that you have emerald ash borer in that tree at a high level. Okay, some more of the nitty gritty things that um, aren't symptoms of anything else, they're signs of EAB. We have here the famous D-shaped exit hole. This is when the adults come out of the tree. And if you chop an emerald ash borer, if you take a cross section, they're D-shaped. So their exit hole is D-shaped. And there's another one over here. And the reason I haven't really made the picture much bigger is that although it's quite distinctive, it is small and it can come out on the top of the bark ridge like this, and it's nice and obvious relatively, or it could come out inside of a ridge, it's upside down. It, they're very difficult to see. Um, so you can use them to confirm that you have emerald ash borer, but it's unlikely that that's the first thing you're gonna notice. Um, the, the branch dieback and the woodpecker damage are much more obvious. Um, and you can see this tree actually already has quite a bit of, of, of woodpecker damage. Um, over here, we've got some bark that just fell off a heavily infested tree with a light tug, um, lots of tunnels. And of course, here is the beast itself in larval form feeding in a tunnel. Um, here's some more tunnels. I, I believe this is Bud's hand um, pointing out some tunnels under the tree. And you can see they have this characteristic serpentine shape. They sort of winding around. And of course, once the tree dies, it becomes quite brittle. And so this is pictures um, after a big windstorm in 2018. I, I received several pictures from people about property damage. Uh, fortunately, no pictures or reports of, of people being squished by falling ash trees. But um, here's a, an ash tree that's fallen on somebody's um, SUV. And here's somebody in Bethany whose porch railing got taken out. And this is fairly minor damage, but um, it does illustrate a problem uh, is that once ash trees die, they're actually pretty fragile. They're pretty brittle. And they're infamous for not even being as predictable as to fall over in storms, but to have a clear blue still day and all of a sudden they'll drop a limb. Um, so this highlights the issue that um, EAB is not only a damage danger to the ash trees, um, but it's a danger, it's a, it's a liability issue, it's a hazard issue. So if you have ash trees that are near a house, near a sidewalk, near a driveway, um, it's important to uh, either protect the tree, and Bud's going to tell you some of the ways you can do that, or uh, when it gets, when it's showing signs of decline to remove the tree so that it doesn't squish anybody. Um, let's see, how am I doing on time? We, um, yeah, so if, Claire, if you could wrap up in maybe five minutes or so, that'd be great. Okay, so um, I don't want to step on Bud's toes too much, so why don't I just go ahead and say that individual trees, if you're concerned with individual trees, then the best way to control the beetles in an individual tree is a chemical control. However, for the forest, this is not feasible. We can't chemically treat all the trees in the forest and we wouldn't want to chemically treat all the trees in the forest. Um, so there is a biological control program and process um, with three imported emerald ash borer parasitoids. And you can see here's the emerald ash borer. 
And here are the parasitoids. And parasitoids are tiny little wasps that live inside the body of the host and kill it. And these are insects that have been found, researched, screened, and brought over from Asia. And I'm just going to very quickly show you a little map of where we've done the releases. We were able to start this in 2013. Um, and parasitoids were released at White Memorial uh, down by, uh, down in Morris, actually. Um, this should be Morris, not Litchfield, because that's where we actually did it um, in 2014 and 15. Um, and we have been releasing lots and lots of these wasps and we've been recovering them. So pretty much anywhere except for the most recent releases, we've, we've recovered it. Um, I think what I'll do is because I've taken a lot of time is I wanna let Bud go ahead and talk about the ins and outs of how do you protect your trees and what you can do and the decisions you need to make when you're deciding about whether or not to protect a tree. Um, I would be very happy to talk to anybody more about the biological control program and the questions afterwards. Um, and if you have more questions, um, then feel free to contact me with either email or the phone. Um, at my office and I will be happy to talk to you about that. Okay, um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to you. moderator. Thanks, Claire. Um, so Bud, if you would unmute your microphone and Chris, if you would share your screen. Uh, Chris will be hosting the slides that uh, uh, Bud's gonna be referring to. And uh, I think we're making progress. Fantastic. All right, take it away, Bud. Good afternoon. Um, it's our pleasure to come to present what we know about the emerald ash borer. And we first started with this program with US Forest Service in Socrates, New York in 2011. And every year for seven years, we went to a different town in Connecticut and did our dog and pony show on what can be helped with the uh, emerald ash borer and what to look for. But the ash wood is very, very useful wood. It makes some of the finest furnitures and flooring and wood handles and cabinets. Uh, very, very good wood. And it's gonna be missed by a lot of people, especially the loggers and uh, the sawmills and the people who use that type of wood. Um, we get, we still get calls for coming to inspect ash trees. Uh, when we come on a property, we don't do this to your tree in, in, unless it's beyond hope. And if we're trying to save an ash tree, we take a look at the foliage and if the foliage is uh, maybe 30% gone. That's the maximum amount of foliage loss. Um, so we can try to save the tree. And there are several ways that we work to save the tree. One is with uh, injection into the cambium tissue, more importantly, the phloem, which for the insect uh, likes to make its damage. Um, and um, we use this insecticide called emimectin benzoate. Um, and the ideal time to inject your ash trees uh, is from mid-May to the end of June. And weather conditions are important. We'd like to see the low humidity, bright sunny skies, uh, soil moisture content 65% or better, um, a slight breeze. And what happens when the trees are injected, the insecticide translocates through the trees rapidly when those weather conditions prevail. 
You can also inject during the summer, providing you have enough of moisture in the ground. You can't inject a tree unless the moisture in the soil is up to a certain point because the insecticide will actually burn the tree. Uh, so you want that to move through the circulatory system of the tree all the way out to the leaves. Um, and this is done with uh, an injection system. As you see in this photo, uh, we drill into the root flares at a 90 degree angle. We use a 1564 drill bit. It has to be really sharp. We drill in there uh, from five eighths to one and five eighths uh, inches deep in hardwoods and a little more than that into the conifers. Um, the, what we do is we come up to the tree and we measure the diameter uh, with a diameter tape. We get the circumference of the tree and it reads on the other side there the diameter of the tree. Uh, if you don't have a uh, diameter tape, you can measure the surf circumference at four and a half feet above the ground, what we call diameter breast height. You can take the circumference of the tree and divide it by three and get an estimated uh, diameter of the tree. And um, we install those valves that you see on the ground into the tree and it's all interconnected with uh, hoses to a canister. And the hoses are clear plastic and the insecticide that we use is a color blue. So we could watch um, the insecticide passing through the hoses and into the valve assembly. And um, we, it depends upon the diameter of the tree, how healthy the tree is, is how much milliliters of insecticide that we do use. Uh, and if the conditions are right, all those weather conditions are right, um, and the canister is kept at 45 pounds, you pump that up with a bicycle pump, that tree should absorb all that insecticide in 10 to 15 to 20 minutes. And once the, there's no more blue, in the hoses, um, we release a pressure on the canister and um, we flush the system out. I use purified water because I don't want any contaminants from a faucet or anything else going into the tree. And so we'll put anywhere between three and 500 milligrams of um, purified water into the canister. And then we pump that canister back up to 45 pounds and it flushes the system off. There's no waste. Everything that's in those hoses and those valve assembly go directly into the tree. And in fact, the added water helps the insecticide translocate through the tree at a faster rate. Um, there are other ways that you can treat ash trees. One was with a soil drench. It's not my favorite item or tool to use at all. In fact, I don't use it uh, with this insecticide called aminocloprid. And the trade name is um, Merit, M-E-R-I-T and a soil drench around the tree, but bearing in mind, you're only allowed to use a soil drench around a tree in only so many square feet in an acre uh, that you can uh, apply that. The other way to do that, and we do that after years of uh, injecting the tree to, to primarily to save drilling back into that cambium layer 
um, we use this insecticide called Safari. It's a dinotafarin and we use it as a bark spray and we start five feet off the ground and we saturate the bark all the way down to including the root flare. And the bark absorbs the insecticide. And bearing in mind, it's gotta be ideal conditions to do that. The low humidity, sunshine, a breeze, and moisture content in the soil, all those primary concerns. Um, and we take care of a tree on the Middlebury Conservation property. It's a specimen white ash. It's 55 inches in diameter. And we've been taking care of that tree for six years. And it's amazing. Um, the application of Mmectin benzoate is good for six, I mean, excuse me, two years. And at the end of two years, it doesn't just shut itself off. It tapers off. So you've got a little bit of leeway time for your next uh, injection. You should be able to see where the previous injection was into the root flares. But uh, now uh, we apply uh, Safari to the dr uh, trunk. And then if it's a heavy crown tree, we'll go up in the tree with a backpack sprayer with the Safari in it and we'll saturate the bark uh, five feet of the tree, all the way around the tree. This is uh, to help get that safari into the circulatory system of the tree. And because uh, the limbs will draw off a lot of the, of the, of the product. So we want to make sure that that gets all the way to the crown and that once it's absorbed into the bark, it'll be 24 to 36 hours, and that insecticide is all the way through the circulatory system of the tree. Uh, the insect has to have active phloem tissue in the tree in order to survive. So when the tree, there's no more active phloem tissue, the insects will die and they'll die inside the tree on many occasions. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about dead ash trees. They go from a liability from a, um, the, um, they go from a really good tree and then into a liability. Ash trees die rel rot, 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 relatively fast. And the problems that we're faced with is uh, there's only three things you can do. You can remove it, you can treat it, or you can just let it fall apart, and it will, as Claire said before. The tree will fall apart. You have to understand, though, it's not like an oak tree or a maple. The roots start rotting very fast because they got exposure to oxygen and moisture. And and a type of wood. You leave ash, untreated ash wood out, it goes to the pot really quick. And as Claire said, on a totally calm day, a totally calm day, the tree will just fall over wherever the weight takes it. So it's really important that you address the dead ash trees around your property, especially if you've got kids running around the yard on a nice day, that tree could just fall right over. Um, and and uh, to remove it, you know, sometimes it's gonna be very, very expensive. We tried to promote a program where if you had a specimen ash tree in your yard to treat it, because when this tide has gone through, it'll help with the reforestation of the ash tree. Uh, but, you know, it's expensive to treat a tree, uh, but it's a whole lot less expensive than to take it down or pay for damage when it comes down. Uh, so it's important to address the, the, the failing ash trees. 
they make very good firewood. Uh, even after a year or so after all the foliage is gone, the, the fire, the wood is still good enough to um, burn. It's an excellent fireplace wood. It's not such a good wood stove wood because it's, it's uh, not dense like oak and hickory and black birch and trees like that. But the, the, the treatment of it is really essential if you want to keep the tree in good health. Not just injection once, but uh, every two years. So I know that the highway departments are troubled with the cost of removing these ash trees in many towns, small towns, don't have the financial backing to remove all the trees. We mark the trees that have to come down and then it's up to the tree remover to take them down. So I, it's pretty much what I have to say about it uh, and we'll certainly entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Bud. Appreciate your contributions today. Um, and uh, thank you, Claire and Chris. Uh, you, uh, this was a great presentation. Um, so I'm going to open it up to the group, uh, to their attendees, uh, to uh, ask any questions. They can either ask questions through the Q&A portion of the uh, Zoom or the chat, and I'll try to, I'll try to facilitate those. And so as people are um, typing away, Oh, also Jerry Griswold can will chime in if any questions come across Facebook Live, um, and uh, so as people are typing away, um, I, I have a couple. I have a question that I'd like to ask. Um, like to ask Bud, but I think it also could be uh, the two. Uh, Claire might have, and Claire and Chris may be able to help out here too. So, so it, it sounds like Bud that this um, this pesticide application where we're injecting it into the trees. It sounds like that's a systemic pesticide. So it's, it's found in all parts of the tree. And I think um, this might be important because, correct me if I'm wrong, Claire, does, do the adults have to feed on a portion of the ash too? They feed on a little bit of the leaves and that, that mm -hmm. re re reproduction, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And except for Ammonacton benzoate and including Ammonacton and MMN nectin benzoate, the largest impact the insecticides have on the adults or on the beetle is on the adults in that foliar feeding before they lay eggs. So yeah. it's actually, it's really good because you cut off the life cycle before the beetle even gets into the tree. Um, Emma Mectin seems to have some impact on the larvae that are feeding on the phloem, but um, the other insecticides mentioned um, predominantly work on the adults eating the leaves. Excellent. Yeah. If, if I could just, I'll just make oh, a slight sure. contribution on that too. Yeah. Um, so because this is kind of, it, it's something of a slow process, how these insecticides work. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. Um, because the damage is being done to the phloem system and it's being done by the next generation, and you're, tre you're mostly treating the adults, um, trees don't get necessarily get better right away. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why it's important to catch the infestation very early uh, for, in order to be effective. Right. Yeah. right. At this point, at this point um, especially in Litchfield, but in general in Connecticut, it is the time to go out and assess your property, see how yeah. many ashes you have, whether or not you want to save them. And then um, if you do, or even if you don't, contact a licensed arborist to come help you do that triage, make those decisions and how to, how to proceed from there. Um, I don't think there's really, you don't wanna wait on this because the more damage the tree gets, the harder it is to save it. And taking down dead ash is very expensive um, because it's dangerous and it needs to be done very carefully. So you definitely want to get in touch with the licensed arborist about your ash trees uh, sooner rather than later. 
Is uh, we have a question on from a uh, from an anonymous attendee asking they they think they have an ash tree in their yard, but they'd um, they would like to know how to get a hold of a licensed arborist. Is there a directory in the state or um, or some central place, or should they just go to the yellow pages, so to speak, the old tried and true way of finding finding professionals? Um, is there something? Is there some repository of information? You want me to jump in on that one? because <laughs> I'm kind of the keeper up of the uh, CTPA website. Yeah. Um, so yes, my recommendation would be to go to the uh, website for the Connecticut Tree Protective Association. Um, and so it's ctpa.org. Um, and one of the buttons you'll see on the page is uh, how to find an arborist. Um, the This gets a little complicated, so I'll try to just say it quickly. Um, CTPA members are, most of them are licensed arborists, but not all licensed arborists in Connecticut are CTPA members. Um, so what we try to do on our website is make that point, And we have a directory of all licensed arborists in the state of Connecticut. So you can, you, you'll be able to find that, uh, you, you know, if, if you look a little bit on our webpage. Um, the licensing is done by the Connecticut DEP. Um, and if anyone is to come out and um, work on your trees and, um, and leave a live tree after they're, they're gone, they must be licensed um, by the state of Connecticut. Um, that's a requirement. Um, so all that's on the ctpa.org website. The other method that people commonly use um, is just word of mouth. Um, so if you've got a neighbor or friend and, and they've, you know, they've worked with an arborist, um, you know, that, that, that's a good lead as well. Um, final thing to mention, uh, besides checking to see whether the arborist is licensed, make sure they're insured. Yeah, especially in this day and age, that's very helpful. Um, thank you, uh, that answered the question beautifully. Um, and and if, um, I, I guess this would pretty much, this. I mean, because we're at that stage when it comes to ash, that ashes are kind of declining. It, this would really go hand in hand with any declining tree in your yard is really the, 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 the sage, that sage advice for, for really any tree or any kind of maintenance of trees in your yard is using a licensed arbor. It's gonna be really helpful um, in the long run. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Sure. I have a question. I want to know is uh, when, when the trees start showing blonding, is it, is it too late to treat them? Are they goners when they show that? Do we need to be jumping on this before we start seeing signs? Or can um, be saved? Depending on how much blonding there is, uh, it could be too late. What you want to look at is canopy. As, as Bud was saying, um, about 30% canopy loss, it starts to be the tipping point of when we can reliably save them. You know, there's some research that shows you can get them, you know, even at 50% canopy loss, but that's, you know, tricky. Um, and I don't think anybody is going to guarantee your tree healthy if you're that far gone. Um, so to answer your question, I would go ahead with no signs. We know it's in the area. We know it's killing the trees. Um, and it's a matter of when, not if, your trees will be attacked. There's a few that escape just, you know, by luck, but you shouldn't count on it. We are in possession of a couple of absolutely stunning ash trees at White Memorial that are now, they now have blonding on them and it's just, they're huge and beautiful trees. And we How know- How are the canopies? Uh, the canopies are good, Jamie. Well, yeah, they're starting to decline. There's some heart rot in the trees. The trees are really large. They're like a 50 inch diameter. They've been there for, for over a hundred years. And unfortunately we're starting to see some of the outward signs of heart rot. So we're kind of thinking that they're gonna to have to come down. Um, and um, and they, the unfortunate thing is they also date back to, the, to Elaine and Mae White who started the whole organization. They were planted there. So, um, so it's very unfortunate, but that's just, the, again, part of this whole story that we're part of now is that we're seeing these favorite trees um, that are going through decline uh, from a variety of factors. Uh, and and we, have to, we have to figure out what the, the strategy is gonna be uh, mm -hmm. for removing them. <laughs> 50 inch diameter trees are 
they're tricky to remove. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have to figure out how we're going to take those down. Um, but um, I, I, I no. have another. I have another question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a question for Bud. Um, I want to know, Bud, how did you get on the ground floor of this? It seems like you've been involved in this since the insect first turned up in Connecticut. How did that happen? Um, I think I can give the credit to Chris Donnelly because um, we had the opportunity to go to Socrates, New York, as I said, worked with the U.S. Forest Service. And uh, so some selected people went, actually Clara went and Chris went and other people from DEP. And we went to the class at, I um, can't remember his name. Anyway, he was in charge of, uh, what's that? Norm Siever. Oh yeah. And um, we actually went out in the field and cut trees down and brought the, what we call bolts. They're about a meter long back to the delimbing room. And um, as you saw, the, maybe you didn't see it. Uh, we would get together and would use a draw knife and totally debark the wood and uh, uh, to try to locate and find a, uh, an infected piece of wood so they could do an adequate survey. And then the stipulation was that somebody who has an outdoor wood furnace would come at the end of the program and pick up all the debark bolts along with the bark. And they had a certain amount of time to bring it back to their place and, and burn it in an outdoor furnace. Um, and so the following year, the um, discovery was made in Prospect and uh, we went to a seminar, we went to a meeting uh, at the firehouse with the mayor and Dr. Rutledge and um, other key people involved with this eradication program. And uh, uh, it was a new find in Connecticut. So we conducted a seminar a couple months later for our first one and invited the public in. And then the following year, we went to Middlebury and then to Southbury and to Monroe and to Durham. Um, and Claire and Sandy and I actually went to Massachusetts to do a uh, one day seminar. Uh, so that's how we got involved in that. It just sort of avalanche down the hill and we just kept going. Thanks, bud. And I, and I have one more question as well. Since nobody else has questions, I'm, I'm going to completely take over. All right. So I hear about, you know, we hear about also not only the Ember Ash Borer, the Asian Longhorn Beetle. And from what I've learned, when a tree that's been infested by the Asian Longhorn Beetle um, is taken down, it's like stomped to death, burned to death immediately. And, you know, get it, everything out of here, get all the remains of it out of here. So why, when we're taking down ash trees, why aren't we doing the same? Why aren't we, I mean, I know that the beetles have pretty much have, have exited, but there has to be stuff left in there. Why aren't we just completely burning immediately every single thing to stop the further spread? Well, um, the it, it, once a phloem tissue is gone, the insects, are, the larvae is gone dies. It has to have active loam, phloem in order to survive. And whereas the Asian longhorn beetle, the last time I knew that attacks 13 species of trees, including ash. And um, uh, so the, if, the, if the larvae is left in the tree and the tree is dead, the, the larvae is dead. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a broader reason too. Um, Asian longhorn beetle uh, there's slight differences in the biology that really impact how well it moves through the landscape. They tend to come back to the same tree over and over again. They tend to take about five years to kill a tree. Um, so they don't move very far, very fast. So it was undiscovered in um, 
Worcester. Winchester, uh, Winchester, Worcester, Massachusetts for 13 years. And it got really far. It infested a lot of trees, thousands of trees. But if that had been EAB in that time span, it would have already been to Colorado. EAB is a, moves a lot more quickly. It kills the trees more quickly. They don't tend to return to the same tree necessarily. They don't have that much of a bias towards coming back. So almost inevitably, by the time we discover it, it's been there five or six years or three or four, depending on lucky we are. And it's already gone further on another, you know, 10 kilometers or another spot. So even though eradication was a goal early on. Um, a lot of the same tactics were tried for emerald ash borer that they're used for ALB, but um, it did no good. Uh, essentially, the, the most useful thing was in slowing the spread was controlling the humans who are carrying them around rather than um, directly trying to kill the beetles. So, so that's another reason why we don't really uh, worry about leaving the tree be. We still don't want to really carry it around the wood after, but we don't we don't need to do anything with the wood because as Bud said, most of the larvae die anyway and anything that's left is going to be a drop in the bucket compared to what's there. And in, in another aspect of it, we've kind of lost the battle with the AB. We kind of hate to say it. Um, yeah. It, so, it, so the biocontrol is is yeah, and, and I, actually, I'd like Claire, since we've got an opportunity, talk a little bit more about that because that's the hopeful, okay, does this mean all our ash trees are gone or is there hope? Turn it over to you. <laughs> There's hope. Um, so, uh, you know, long-term, there's gonna be two things that really help. And one is there's a strong natural selection on the ashes. Um, and some of them, there is levels of tree resistance. So there's going to be ash that survive. Um, so, you know, gradually over time, those will spread. Um, but the other thing is that we're introducing natural enemies um, from, from their home range that are very, very specific to them. Um, and they are getting established in Connecticut. We are finding them um, again after we let them out and we're finding them at pretty high rates of, of parasitism. So, you know, 40, 60% of the beetles being killed. Um, and the big difference between the parasites as a control agent as compared to the woodpeckers is that the woodpeckers are generalists. They're gonna go for where there is a lot of something. So they'll focus on the EAB and they can kill a whole bunch of them in one tree, but they may not necessarily get the next tree over. And as soon as the population levels drop, which they will because most of the ash trees will die, they'll stop paying attention and they'll go and find something else and allow them to build that population up again. Whereas the parasitoids, the only thing they can eat is emerald ash borer. So they, will continue to inflict mortality upon the emerald ash borer no matter what its population level is. And so hopefully um, sort of the dynamic that we uh, see happening is that after the emerald ash borer levels drop after that peak, after a lot of the ash have died, then the parasitoids will follow them down, so to speak, and then keep that level down. And that's what we're, we're hoping will happen. Um, as always, biocontrol is a long game. So, you know, it's looking good at this point. We're getting pretty high levels. It seems to have, you know, it's established. We're getting pretty high levels of parasitism. It seems they're, they're moving through the landscape well. Um, and, you know, now is sort of the waiting game and we're doing um, research and trying to figure out, you know, how they're impacting ash growing back. So, you know, and, it, and early results on that from Michigan, because they started the program about five years earlier there, are looking promising. Um, but I mean, it's definitely going to change the composition of our forests. Uh, I don't think we're going to stop that, but it will be very interesting to see how well they do and, and 
fingers crossed. I was really um, happy, Chris, when you were talking about the impact culturally that losing this tree has um, because David Leff wrote an article for our quarterly newsletter, a sanctuary um, about the cultural loss, the impact on, on, on basket makers and on snowshoe makers and on the Louisville slugger uh, because of the loss of, of this tree. Uh, and that was, I think something that people really don't um, think about is uh it is that this certain tree i mean almost every every louisville slugger is made out of ash and so now they're testing other uh, woods to see if they'll be viable for baseball bats so um pretty profound yeah we have a question uh from an attendee that wants to know um if you want to burn the ash firewood from your own property how long after the tree dies can the can you still harvest the wood? And I guess it's viable for, for firewood. The, uh, yeah, there's kind of two, two parts to that question. Um, the, the longer you leave the tree, the more hazardous it becomes. And that includes when you go to take it down. So um, I, I, and I, I mentioned this because I want to kind of go back to a point that was we've been talking about. Um, make your decision about your ash trees early because if you decide to remove them, you're better off removing them while they're still alive. Uh, it'd be a lot safer, it'd be a lot less expensive. Um, as far as uh, the, uh, the, how long does the wood persist? Once you've taken the tree down and, and you've properly stored the firewood, um, it can, uh, one of the things about firewood that they always, about ash firewood that they always say is it can be burned pretty much immediately. Um, it doesn't have to season as much as say oak or, or other firewoods. Um, and if and if it's well, you know, well protected firewood, you you've got it uh, stored in a dry place. It's going to last pretty much indefinitely. So, you know, it it, it once it dries, um, it needs moisture in order to decay. So once it dries, you know, you don't anticipate a lot of decay moving into the wood. So the reoccurring theme is to remove the trees early, or do your do whatever your decisions need to be as early as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's great, guys. Um, I uh, thank you all, uh, Chris and Claire and Bud. Thank you very much for the, your your presentations today. This was very informative, um, and uh, I, I really appreciate you spending your Saturday afternoon <laughs> uh, helping us out and helping out our, our attendees. I'm going to turn it over to Jerry just to wind things up a little bit, just to recap on our calendar and our membership. Oh, it looks like Claire, you have something. I just want to add that I was when Chris told me that um, you guys wanted to do this seminar. I'm always happy to help White Memorial. You guys have been such great partners in my research that um, anything I can do for you, I'm here. So well, thank you, thank, thank you, you Claire. I, yeah. I smell an Asian longhorn beetle program coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Southern <laughs> pine beetle, spotted lantern fly, whatever. Yes, spotted yeah. lantern fly too. We should all talk about all those denizens. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I just want to thank Claire and Chris and Bud. Jamie, thank you so much for uh, um, hosting this today. And uh, and again, this evening at 7 p.m., Robert Missouri is doing a free concert on Zoom and our Facebook page on Facebook Live. Uh, so I hope you'll join us at seven o'clock for some beautiful American kind of music he is wildly talented i remember what's going on next week uh thursday carrie schved our beautiful education director is going to be doing a program for youngsters her nature's nursery and that is at four o'clock on thursday you can always check out our uh, website whitememorialcc.org to find out all of these uh, about all these goodies and then next saturday at noon november 14th at noon it's the pandemic pantry where i'm going to cook um healthful uh things for your holidays um well some most of them are healthful. I'm doing chocolate <laughs> truffles and pie. I'm sorry. It can't all be about healthful eating. Uh, so that's next Saturday at noontime. So uh, again, for the White Memorial Conservation Center and all. Oh, do we have another question here? Yeah. What? What? What is? Oh, oh I guess. We... Oh, how can we contact Claire and Bud? Oh, right, right. Um. So yeah. Um. Let's do that. So. 
Claire, why don't you uh, tell folks your, your email address and, uh, and then Bud, when you can unmute your microphone and you can tell us yours and, and same with Chris, uh, let's, let's do that. If you, if you feel comfortable putting it on the internet like that, um, it'll, be, it'll be recorded and it'll be uploaded. If not, they can contact me um, and James at whitememorialcc.org and I can forward it to individuals as they, as they ask. So, um, oh, that sounds probably good. The easiest way to find me is I'm at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And if you just go to their website, I'm in the staff directory, and that will have all the different ways to get a hold of me. So I'm, I'm at the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station down in New Haven. And Claire, the spelling of your last name? It's uh, Rutledge, R U T L E D G E, like a ledge, Rutledge. Great. Thank you again so much, everybody. And thanks again for the White Memorial Conservation Center. I am Jerry Griswold and uh, hope to see you at seven tonight for some music. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>